Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. We have been focusing in on the fact that Jesus is greater than the Levitical priesthood. He's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek as established by God himself. We closed out talking about the fact that Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto him that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And uh, notes the looking for. And he's going to continue to talk about that as we get towards the end of chapter number 10 here as well. Now, in Hebrews chapter number 6, we looked at a very difficult portion of Scripture. Many have stated the most difficult portion of Scripture, maybe in, in the whole Bible. And uh, spent some time talking about that, often preached and taught out of context, and get into a very similar one here in uh, Hebrews chapter number 10. Not so difficult considering the information that we have gained already, but uh, we will take some time to talk about that as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll dive right in here. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your power and your glory and how wonderful and majestic that you are as we think about that song that was just played for us and, and yet as powerful and as mighty and holy that you are, you have a love for us. It was that love that opened up the door of salvation to us. We pray for those who may be here tonight, maybe somebody watching online that has not yet trusted Jesus as the sacrifice for their sins. I pray that this might be the moment where your spirit convicts them of their sin and helps them to see that Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection is the only payment for that sin. They'd be saved. Lord, for Christians, I pray that you continue to challenge us uh, Lord, as we think about our world today and our society that we live in, the pressure upon Bible-believing Christians grows greater and greater. And I pray that you'd help us to continue to be faithful, not to quit and not to give up and not to turn aside, Lord, knowing there is a great reward ahead of us for those who are faithful. Work in our hearts, we ask you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get into verse number one here. We've got a lot of ground we want to cover here tonight. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. And of course, we talked about the true tabernacle in heaven, how that uh, Moses was uh, given uh, kind of the pattern of things, that it was... Uh, just an image, and here he talks about it being a shadow, which means a pale shadow in, in contrast to a sharp, distinct one. And of course, reminds me of what Paul wrote, that now we look through a glass dimly. One day we're going to see very clearly as we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Well, these things were just a vague shadow and not the very image of the things. It's not the sharp clear picture, it's not the true representation, um, and be, because of that, it could not make the comers perfect, as it says here. They had to offer them year by year. And he says in verse 2, that for then would they not have ceased to be offered. And he says, you know, he's kind of making a, a rational discussion with them, that, that if they were to make the offers perfect they would have ceased to be offered. You wouldn't have had to offer it any longer. And one other thing we note from verse number 2 here is this was written before A.D. 70 because he notes that they, it implies that they are still being offered to that day. Uh, but because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. And so he notes the fact that, that the, the sacrifices they had to offer year after year after year brought up that remembrance of their sin, of their shortcomings, of their failures. And if it had done the job that 
uh, the complete job, then they wouldn't have had it offered anymore. But we think of that new covenant that we did talk about. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 12, says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember no more? And, of course, that is made possible through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he very plainly says, and we pointed to it last week when we were talking about the sacrifice of Jesus, in verse number 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It was never possible. That was not what it was designed to do. Atonement is the idea of cover. Now, it would cover the sins... Basically, it'd roll it over for another year, and as long as you offered the sacrifices the next year, it would continue to roll over, but it was never designed or intended to take away sins. He says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And uh, we're... Uh, uh, well, let's see, in verse number 6, he says, "...in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure." And um, he uh, is here quoting uh, from Psalm chapter number 40, if you want to turn over there, Psalm chapter 40. Beginning in verse number 6. We'll read down to verse number 8 together. It says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And of course we know this to be the Lord Jesus Christ who is speaking. And uh, we think of verse number 7, that the volume of the book is written of him, and one of the greatest joys is to study the entire scripture and see how all the different things, the sacrifices, the feasts, the tabernacle, all the pieces of furniture and everything else pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. And then he makes this statement here, mine ears hast thou opened and uh, the word open here is the idea of digged or pierced. And is a reference back to Exodus chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. And if thy servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And the idea of the bond slave, and often they would wear an earring as a mark that they had been freed and yet were still choosing. Um, but he says, and, and points to the burnt offering, the sin offering, hast thou not required. And of course, this is used here in Hebrews chapter number 10 uh, to point to the fact that it was not this offering, it was a body that ha hast thou prepared me. And uh, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ was that offering and that sacrifice, and he very willingly gave and offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. And then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. And of course we think of the Lord Jesus Christ as he is crying out to his Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He said, nevertheless, not my will. But thy will be done. And uh, he looked and, and did what the Father had sent him to do. He continues on here. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. And of course he's uh, pointing to the fact that these things, as he's already stated, could not make the comers perfect. Verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And of course, we've already talked about those covenants. Uh, the old covenant versus the new covenant here. Both of those were blood covenants. And as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm hoping 
sometime next year to be able to maybe do a series on the blood covenant and give us a greater understanding of those things. But that was the reason that he came. And what a wonderful thought there. And you can see throughout the Old Testament that he was testified that he would come. And he promised that he would. And of course, he fulfills that promise. He says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And how wonderful that that is. It's not something that's offered every single year. And you notice here, this is not a, a, a partial sacrifice. He didn't just die and pay the price for a few people. He didn't buy, die and pay the sins of all the people that had lived up to that point and paid the price for their sins. No, once for all, past sins, future sins. He paid the price for everybody. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And, uh, of course, when he talks about daily ministering and these different offerings, oftentimes he's not, no longer talking about the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement where he'd go in one time, but he's, he's talking about the repetition. We've looked at those things as well. And uh, points to the fact, he continues to harp home, that those things could not take away sin. It was his body, it was his sacrifice, was the only thing that could do it. He says, but this man, a after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And so he, he offered one sacrifice for sins, for all of sins. And then you'll notice it tells us that he sat down on the right hand of God. Now he's right now at God's throne. One day he's going to come and he's going to sit on his own throne. And, uh, but you notice he's sitting because his job is complete. And you go back into uh, the Old Testament, you study the Levit Levitical priesthood, there was nowhere to sit down in the tabernacle. Why? Because they had to stay busy. I mean, some of those instruments were created in such a way that you couldn't put them down or else you'd spill the blood and the other things because uh, they were not to rest from what they were doing. It was to offer, and uh, they had to continually be working, continually offering the incense and the sacrifices and all those things. But he sat down at the right hand of God, verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. And this is a verse that has been brought up over and over again here in our study of Hebrews. From Psalm 110, verse number 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And uh, you just stop and you think about, and, and you can take some time yourself to just compare Jesus' priesthood and what he did with the Levitical priesthood. You know, you've got the fact that many priests compared to his one, the many sacrifices compared to his one, they're standing, he's sitting, and uh, so many other things. And you can kind of continue that out for yourself, but he's making some of these points and showing why Jesus, as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, is a greater priesthood than that of the Levitical priesthood. He says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. The completeness of of the work that he had done. You know, you think about he's perfected them forever that are sanctified. Only took that one offering. Now think about a Colossians 2.14. It tells us blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now one of the things that they would do here during this time is they would have a certificate of debt. It was a legal and a criminal term. Now, we kind of use the terminology today, you know, talking about somebody paying their debt to society or whatever, uh, you know, talking about doing their time in prison. Well, they literally had a piece of paper that they would write on. And that jailer had to keep track as they would do their time. He'd mark off the year. If you had five years and at the end of one year, he'd mark a year off. Now, if that prisoner escaped, whatever time was left, that jailer had to pay the debt. 
That's why you have in the New Testament, the Philippian jailer, when he sees that all the, the doors and everything's open, all the shackles are loose, he's going to kill himself. Why? Because all these prisoners have gone free. He's as good as dead anyway. He's going to live the rest of his life in prison paying for their debt. And of course, they cried out, do yourself no harm. We're all here. Why? Because he would have to pay their debt. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ has paid that debt for us. When that prisoner would, would finish out his time, they'd write on there to tell us die, paid in full. Or the way that Jesus said it as he took his last breath, it is finished. Very same words. When Jesus died, he said, paid in full. I've offered the sacrifice. The handwriting and the ordinances is against you. The debt has been paid. He offered it one time and has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also was a witness to us. For after that he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And of course, once again, he's quoting from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And of course we did make note that that new covenant was made with the children of Israel. But we as Gentiles have been grafted in by His grace and His mercy. And... Uh, he talks about the fact that because they rejected him, blindness in part has happened until the fullness of the Gentiles should come in. And so he warned the church not to brag about that fact. Don't brag about the fact just because you are grafted in. Don't think you're better than the children of Israel. The day's coming. That fullness of Gentiles comes in. He's going to graft back in the true olive branch, as he stated. And we looked at some of those things already, but... This new covenant that he references. He's not, he's, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Not just going to cover them. Not just going to roll them over for another year. They are going to be paid for and done away with. He says in verse 18, Now where remission of, of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So if the sin's been paid for, if they've been paid in full, you, there's no reason to offer another sacrifice. You don't have to go back and offer the sacrifices to atone for sin. Now the day is coming in the future, in the millennial kingdom, where sacrifices will be done again. Not to atone for sin, but as a reminder of what Jesus Christ has done. And uh, But... As far as paying and atoning for sin, it's no longer necessary. And because of that, we get to verse number 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And we have spent some time already discussing the access. And he knows the limited access of the Levitical priesthood. I mean, to get, to get on the grounds of the tabernacle, you had to be a Levite. Entered into the holy place, you had to be a son of Aaron. And of course, to get into the holy of holies, or the holiest places, he says here in Hebrews, high priest, once a year. You better have that blood with you. There was limited access. But because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said that we can have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. He says, by a new and living way. That new word new there is the idea of a, something that was lately slaughtered or freshly killed. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And of course, we're reminded of that veil that was 
rent in twain, opening up, signifying an opening up of access to God the Father by the tearing of the veil of the Lord Jesus Christ, His flesh, the sacrifice of Him, opened that up. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Because we have this high priest, we can draw near. And he states how we ought to draw near. He says, let us draw near with a true heart. The idea of sincerity. Now coming up, we're on Sunday mornings, we're going to be doing a new series called The Show Must Go On. We're talking about hypocrisy from Matthew chapter number 23. And what the Lord has to say about that. And the religious crowd is very good at putting on a mask and putting on some sort of performance and trying to put on the aura that we are righteous and we are good people. But he says, I want you to draw near with a true heart in sincerity. He says, in full assurance of faith. And if we know the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, we have that full assurance. I don't have to doubt, I don't have to question, I don't have to wonder. You know, think about the many people that we talk to uh, going door to door about the Lord Jesus Christ as the way of salvation. That we talked to one, one young lady on Tuesday night. You know, do you know for sure? I mean, I, I, I hope. What are you trusting in? Uh, you know, I think I'm a good person. You know, always questioning, always wonder. That's, you see, that's what works does. You never know. I never know if I'm good enough. I never know if I've done enough to please God. If I never know if I've done enough to make it. But when I'm trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I can come in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And uh, here he's, he's drawing a comparison to some of the ceremonial things that the priests would do ceremonial washings and different things and um, the sprinkling of the blood, as he noticed in, in having our hearts sprinkled. And he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And, and the major theme of what he's covering in the book of Hebrews, we've got to understand who he's talking to. It's, in the title of the book, he's writing to Hebrew believers. They'd come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They had suffered some persecution. We'll see that in just a, just a minute. But people were dying. People were being martyred for the faith. And I'd like to say that no matter what happens in our country, no matter if they pointed a gun to my head or whatever else, that I wouldn't deny the faith. But I'd have no idea. Until we're put in those circumstances, I don't know. And so we can't point a finger and say, man, some of these people, because you don't know what you would do. I don't know what I would do. I'd like to say I would. That God would give me the strength. But here we have people that were moving away from the believers and from the church. And they were going back into Judaism. They were going back to offer the sacrifices at the temple and all those types of things. They were moving away from meeting with the congregation of believers and they were going back to that religion. That's the whole theme of what he's talking about in the book of Hebrews. And so he says, listen, you need to hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering. You can have a full assurance. You don't need to waver. And he's going to here go into some of these things as we get into what for, for some, especially if you take it out of context and don't understand who he's writing to and the reason he's writing the book can cause some problems and people take it out of context to teach, I believe, some things that aren't true about the scripture, but hold fast. And you notice, based upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's promised, it says, for he is faithful that promise. And, and as we get into Hebrews chapter number 11, the whole point of Hebrews 11 is that it is possible to live a life of faith. Amen. 
It is possible to hold fast to that profession without wavering. You can endure till the end and receive your inheritance. And so he continues on. He's faithful. And he says, verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, this continues with the next verse. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, this is Baptist preacher's favorite verse is number 25, and they often forget verse number 24. And where it tells us, let us consider. We're gonna, we, we see three lettuces here. I have a little salad in the middle of uh, chapter number 10 here. 22 says, let us draw near. 23, let us hold fast. 24, let us consider one another. And the idea of consider here means to perceive to observe, to understand, to consider attentively. It's the idea of a careful investigation or a careful study. And what he's saying is you, you ought to know one another. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, you ought to know one another. You ought to know the struggles that the person sitting in front of you and behind you is facing. You ought to know what they're going through. You ought to be there to Help them. And that goes both ways. That's, that goes with caring about each other. It comes with opening up to one another. You know, confessing our faults one to another. It's okay to share your weaknesses. It's okay to share your struggle. The way we can be a help with one another. Amen. He says we ought to consider one another. You ought to understand each other. To provoke unto love and to good works. And listen, unless I know you, I can't really help you. If I don't know what you're going through, if I don't know the problems and the struggles that you're facing in your life, there's not really much I can do to help you. I mean, I can offer some shallow words. I'll pray for you. You know, God will give you the strength and blah, 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 and things that don't really mean a whole lot. He says you ought to know each other. You ought to be involved in one another's life. And the whole point behind it is so you can provoke unto love and a good works, so you can build up and encourage each other. Because here, these people were struggling. They're on the verge of walking away because of the persecution that they're enduring. And I think there's a lot of people that think about quitting sometimes. We know people, every of us, each of us know people that for whatever reason have walked away from the church. They've walked away from serving the Lord. They've walked away from having fellowship with God and they decided to go their own way and do their own thing. Now here he's not talking about people that are going off and uh, immorality and all this stuff. He's talking about people that are just they're going back to the old religion. But we ought to know each other and try to help each other. Encourage each other to continue on. And, uh, and he connects that here in verse number 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so here he notes the fact, listen, don't walk away. You see, they were leaving the house churches and the gatherings together and the other things to escape persecution. I, I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to have to die. I don't want to have to be beaten. I don't want to have to be thrown in prison or whatever else, the, the persecution that they were facing. And so they would, not necessarily for sin's sake, they weren't assembling together. It was escape persecution, which is often a different reason for why we don't gather together. But he also knows the fact that if, if we're not gathering together, how, how, how are we encouraging one another? Because really the major point behind us gathering together today and tonight is to provoke unto love and to good works. To encourage one another. Amen. If you come to church and the only reason you come to church is so that you can receive, so that I can stand up and give you something, you are not coming for the right reason. You're not coming for the reason 
that God intended. Yeah, that's a part of it. And we ought to come, we ought to have our Bibles, we ought to open them, we ought to take notes, we ought to study so that we can take this stuff out and flesh it out in, in, in the world around us. The business of the church is not right here, it's out there. The church was never intended to bring a bunch of lost people in and preach salvation to them. That was not what church is for. Church is for believers to gather together. To strengthen, to encourage each other so we can go out, so you can go out, so I can go out and tell people how to be saved. But it was to strengthen and encourage each other in the things of the Lord. And some, sometimes we lose that, what the whole purpose of church even is. I mean, if we're not here and we're not active, we don't know who, those who are around us. We're not a lot of help to anybody. And he says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And there is some debate about what this day is. Whether he's talking about the Lord's return, whether he's talking about the destruction that had been foretold, of the temple that was coming very shortly. And here you had these people that were going back to offer the sacrifices and all this stuff. Well, the time was coming very quickly where all the temple and everything else is going to be destroyed and you're not going to be able to offer the sacrifices. And those that took Jesus' words to heart about the judgment to come, the Christians were not killed at the destruction of Jerusalem because they knew it was coming. They weren't there, many of them. It was those that were still trying to follow this works-based religion that were killed. So there's, there's some debate about what this day is uh, that is approaching. But I think that we could make some applications for here and now. The fact is we... We need more of the Bible. We need to gather together and encourage each other more as the time continues on. As our society gets worse, as this world gets worse, and the Bible is very clear that things are going to get extremely bad. You studied the... the the false Christ and Messiahs, the false teachers and everything else that are going to be rampant and we see in our world today, the closer we get to the Lord's return, the more we need to gather together. The more we need to encourage one another. Not less. And unfortunately, in a lot of places, they're going the other way. They're meeting less and less and, and not a lot of help to one another. But let's continue on. He says, for verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you again is and we've talked about it already, especially as we looked at Hebrews chapter number 6. He's writing to Christians here. The Apostle Paul has included himself in this. And uh, he, one of the things he's fighting here is he's fighting against apostasy, those that would turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice and walking with Him in fellowship as they ought to and going back to that uh, religion, if you want to call it that. And uh, one of the things that he notes here, he says, for if we sin willfully, he's uh, pointing to a, the present tense, and it's a continuing action, just much as we saw in Hebrews chapter number 6, that while this action is pertaining, there is no repentance, as we've seen in, in chapter number 6. Um, and, uh, but he does point to the fact that it is knowledge. You know, it's a specific knowledge. These are, he's talking about people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. This isn't somebody that just heard about salvation and, and kind of rejected the plan. He's talking about people that have accepted. And he knows the fact that there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. I mean, if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ's sacrifice. You turn away from that and following Him and 
What are you going to go to? What else is there? He's already noted that the sacrifices of these bulls and goats and everything else was never intended to take away sin. So what are you going to go to? And in fact, even in the Old Testament, there were sins that you could commit that there wasn't a sacrifice for. Think of murder and other things. Think of Numbers 15. You can turn there if you want to. Numbers 15, beginning in verse number 29. It says, Ye shall have one law for him that sinneth through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them. But the soul that doeth ought presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he hath despised the word of the Lord and hath broken his commandment. That soul shall utterly be cut off, his iniquity shall be upon him. And we think of, and we, we finish studying the book of Joshua, you see what Achan did. The penalty for what Achan did was death. They took him out and stoned him. There wasn't a sacrifice that Achan could go and offer, and it's going to be covered. And one of the things that we have to see here is he's pointing to a physical death in this portion of Scripture. And unfortunately, in our minds, we, we, we equate physical death maybe with a loss of salvation. That because God chose to judge somebody by death, that must have meant they lost their salvation or they were never saved in the first place. And uh, that's not the case. In fact, we're going to look at... Uh, that topic here in just a little bit. But here he's, he's noting this is not something that you just kind of accidentally do. This is very willful, it's thought out, and it's a continuing action that's taking place. And of course, one of the things that we note with the book of Hebrews is, is, is he's, not, he's not trying to save sinners in this book. Okay, he's trying to bring sons, those who are already saved, to glory. He's concerned with living a life in such a way that you can receive the inheritance. And then he talked about, uh, verse 27 here, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. In other words, you can do such a thing that rather than finding forgiveness, you're going to find judgment. You're going to find correction for what it is that you're doing. He notes, he gives an example here. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. And of course, he's referencing Deuteronomy 19.15. One witness shall not rise up against the man for any iniquity or for any sin. And any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. But he says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and holy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So he notes in the Old Testament, under two or three witnesses, there were certain crimes that you could commit where you would not receive mercy for it. There was a judgment, there was a penalty, you're stoned to death or whatever because of the sin that you have committed. And you could cry and you could beg and whatever else, but what you got was judgment. And he says, how much sore punishment? Because remember, he's talking about how much greater are these things and how much better. So if under... This system that's just a very shadow of the truth. You have these other sacrifices that couldn't make people perfect. Now you got the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified in a holy thing and had done despite into the Spirit of grace. Of course, you've got those who were turning their back on the sacrifice 
uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ had made. And uh, we're turning back to the Levitical priesthood and those sacrifices. You have this word spirit of grace here. It only appears twice in Scripture. Once here, once in Zechariah 12, verse number 10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Of course, uh, referencing that, uh, that uh, restoration with his people when they will see him. But I think of Peter's words in 2 Peter 2.21, For it had been better for them that not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. They're going to be held accountable. And as we think about what he's talking about here, talking about the blood of the covenant, trotting it underfoot, very reminiscent of what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 with those who were taking the Lord's table in vain. And I want to read these verses to you, beginning in verse 27. It says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So, very similar idea here about not taking the sacrifice seriously. And there were those that died. Some got sick, some died. Does, that doesn't mean they lost their salvation. 1 John 5, 16 tells us there is a sin unto death. And so there may be things that we can do where God will say, that's it, I've had enough, and he'll take a life. There's been people that I've known, and I, I would not say it for certain, but I believe that's what happened. And he continues on here, and he says... Verse 30, we're going we're gonna to speed through this here so we can finish out. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And of course, going back to what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, that the Lord will judge us if we do that. And there's a reference here to Deuteronomy 32. 35 and 36. And uh, part of this is quoted directly from the Hebrew verbatim. Part of it is written in the author's own pattern, kind of their own interpretation of it. It's quoted another time exactly the same way, one other time in Scripture, and that is the Apostle Paul uh, quotes it in 2 Corinthians, uh, or excuse me, Romans chapter number 12. And so just another reason why I believe Apostle Paul is the writer. But we'll continue on. He says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Of course, the Apostle Paul is the one who says that. And uh, he, he notes the fact that we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to give an account of the things that we've done, whether good or bad. And the Apostle Paul was uh, maybe a little apprehensive about that. And he said in 2 Corinthians 5, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Very similar to what he says here. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. We're reminded of what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4, verses 17 and 18, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And uh, for time's sake, we won't go there, but I'd encourage you to turn, when you're able to, to Matthew chapter number 25. And look at this parable he's talking about. And you have this, this servant, parable of the talents. That rather than doing what his master has told him to do, he kind of just wraps it in a napkin. He's held accountable. He's cast out 
into outer darkness, which means the darkness that is outside. It says there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We kind of falsely, because of some information we know about hell and about the lake of fire, we falsely transfer what he says here and, and say, well, God threw him in hell. No, that's not what's happening at all. He's losing his inheritance and his reward. But he says here, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. And one of the great things we can do for somebody who's thinking about walking away is, hey, remember back. Remember when you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because if somebody truly accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, you never forget that. You may not know the exact date and the time and everything else, but you remember. You remember how you felt. You remember what was going on in your heart and in your life. And he says, hey, I want you to call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. I mean, you've gone through suffering, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. And he talks about the persecution that they'd already endured. He says, For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Man, when you first came to know Christ as your Savior, you were willing to be persecuted. You were willing to go through it. You were willing to have them come and take your stuff, knowing, as he says here, that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Now, thinking about what you've went through when you first came to know Christ as your Savior, the thoughts, the feelings, and everything else, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Notice he's not talking about losing salvation here. He's talking about losing your reward. Don't cast away your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. But after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And he notes, yeah, you're going through a difficult time. Yeah, it's hard, but don't give up. Don't lose hope for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. He says, I know it's hard, but the Apostle Paul said this light affliction is but for a moment because he knew that the eternal bared a far greater weight of glory. So the Lord's returning soon. You hold fast until I come, as he told the believers in Thyatira. Now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And uh, we have some other things we'll talk about. The just shall live by faith as we begin there next time we're together.